I'm Lorraine Maffa, Programming Coordinator for Loudoun County Public Library and your host today. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter. Michaela Salamani was born and raised in India and has lived in Loudoun County for over two decades. Much of her art is inspired by her rich, vibrant Indian culture and by the natural beauty in her new home. She is an architect and product designer by education and currently a coach in technology that influences product development, process, and delivery. Michaela sells her paintings and original greeting cards at the Leesburg Farmers Market and donates much of her proceeds to charity. Watercolor is her favorite medium because it encourages freedom of expression. Welcome back, Michaela. Thank you, Lorraine. It's always a pleasure. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, we will go ahead and get started. As you can see on um, the screen share here, I've set out the material for today's, um, today's art. Um, just wanted to start with saying hello to everyone. Some of you may be new, um, so welcome. Some of you, if you're joining again, thank you and welcome again. Um, I did get uh, an email from a participant in the past that they would like to uh, see the, what we are painting, the reference uh, image. So Lorraine has been sharing it uh, so far. But every now and then, if you want to see it again, please do let us know and I can show you where, where, where we are going. Uh, but we don't have another way to keep sharing it throughout, um, the, throughout the live session. Um, so with that, I am actually so thankful that we chose this theme for today. Um, I've had a super busy week. Um, not a bad week, but it's been so much going on that uh, I'm glad we are doing this. This is going to be fun and relaxing and still we'll be creating something nice. Uh, I hope so, but I don't think it can go wrong because we'll just you know play with colors, just use different techniques and uh, enjoy the process. So I hope um, you can paint along or if not, uh, watch the recording or try this on your own. Uh, we'll be using a few different um, watercolor techniques uh, for our work today. Um, the material I have here, as you can see, I have uh, paper. This is watercolor paper. Um, this is cold pressed. This is not 100% cotton. If you've been on any of my se sessions before, we often talk about paper because in watercolor, uh, paper plays a very important role. Today's techniques are uh, are quite fundamental and they uh, most paper types can take that uh, fairly well. So we 100% cotton paper is expensive and I thought this particular painting, uh, while we are gonna do a lot of layers, we uh, will not be doing a lot of color lifting. So this should work just fine and we'll see how that goes. I do have a painter's tape here and I'm gonna use that to uh, tape the edges uh, down to my work board. Today I'm uh, taping it directly on my uh, table because my table uh, can take a little bit of um, a wet cleaning after the process. And um, so in, in, in some of the techniques today, we'll be doing a lot of paint splatter. So it's going to be splattering outside of the paper too. So I didn't want to use another board that would get too much paint. So as you're setting up your workspace, you, you could try to do that too. Or you can always use extra paper to uh, protect the space around you. Um, so that's painter's tape. Um, as always, we will work with three, um, three brushes. I don't have any fancy name brand brush brushes. These have worked well for me. Um, I continue to use them. There's a fine brush, which is um, a size two. You could go even finer, uh, like a size one or a zero. Uh, I personally prefer uh, thicker brushes and use the tip of the brush like this one for finer work uh, because it holds more, uh, more color and more water. So I don't have to keep dipping it back in the color. So that's the thick one and this is a medium sized brush. Uh, Try all of them. Today's painting gives you an opportunity to experiment a lot with different brushes. Um, and uh, either way, you'll be you'll do just fine. So I think it's perfect for um, Friday afternoon to help us all relax and um, not feel the pressure of doing something complex. 
I also, um, I'll be using a, a few different colors. As we get into the painting, I'll talk more about it. You could choose the color for your wildflower um, field today. If you, if you're thinking and if you think you want it to be more look look more like poppies, you could just do red flowers. If you want a more summer feel to it, now that we are in the sunflower season, you could go with the warm color theme of yellows and oranges a little, with a little bit of red. Or you could do a mixed color wild wildflower field, which is always so, so much uh, fun to do. So like this one, this is uh, so a postcard I had painted before. I also like to pay, to put the tape around my work because I'm thinking of it as a postcard. Uh, it gives it a nice border to the work. So colors, if you have the basic three colors, red, yellow, and blue, you should do just fine because we'll be creating a lot of shades mixing those colors. And I do, um, I hope that you have some white. Uh, we will be using some white uh, towards the end of, um, of, of the artwork today. I also have a cup of water here. I like to use a clear um, container because it reminds me when it's time to change the water because uh, sometimes you get into the process and forget that you want to, the, the water you're using already has a shade and it may not uh, give you the blend you're trying to create. Also keep some uh, kitchen napkins handy or uh, a muslin cloth to uh, wash and dry your brushes throughout the process. As I always talk about this, in watercolor, water is your uh, water plays a very critical role, right? Uh, yes, you may have the best of colors, but you really need to work with um, with the concentration of the water, how, how dilute is it? And it changes the way your work looks. And every now and then you have to change the consistency of color and water plays a very important role. I have a little palette here. I'm actually using a ceramic uh, dish from a cup that's broken now. I like to use these small ones. They're easy to clean. And I also like to use the ones without the, the, the dip in it for each color, because in watercolor, you are constantly mixing colors. So, and you don't need a lot of quantity of color. So I like how I see the blend on the uh, on the little palette itself. And, you know, I can decide whether I want to want to make it darker or lighter, adding water or, or not. So that's everything. Any questions before we go ahead and get started? No this questions is what yet, Michaela. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, Today's work, we are not going to be do doing detailing. In my past two sessions, I think we, with the flower, with the water droplet, we did um, a lot of detailing. The last session, we did this sunlight uh, shining through the through the woods. That had many, many layers and uh, was a little complex, actually, I have to say. If, um, uh, but we covered a lot of different techniques. Today is going to be a lot of fun and um, it's impressionist style work. So we're not detailing out every flower, but when you look at it from far, uh, it, it'll give the impression of a wild color field. All right, so with that, I often talk about the proportions as we are setting up our work. Um, if you've attended before, I talk about the rule of thirds. Uh, just the way the eye travels throughout anything that we're looking at or observing, if we divide our workspace into halves, then it is it remains centered to the um, the the vision or our focus remains centered and it often miss, misses some of the information around the image and at the same time we want the eyes to travel but we also want it to be framed within the artwork um, so the rule of thirds is it's a pretty common and a very well known effective rule it's about dividing your um, space and to center the focus in the third half of the uh, of the whole paper. So if you were thinking of this length here, the thirds would be, uh, this would be a third and this would be a third. If you're thinking of it in the other direction, perpendicular to it, this would be a third and this would be a third. Uh, not in today's work, but if I were to place an object of interest, 
I would place it in either the third here or a third here. Uh, I'm not drawing anything. It's just my pencil moving around the space. So don't worry about uh, not being able to see it. Today we are making a slight exception to start our work. That doesn't mean we are not following the, the same proportion standards. But for now, I'm going to draw a line in the center here. And it's it's really not a line that we will be following to the T. It's just a guideline. And uh, we will be um, painting over it. So there isn't a lot to draw or much or anything to draw today. So as you see here, the center is where we will paint the base layers. But as we draw the, the plants and the stems of the uh, um, of the field and the flowers, they will go beyond the half mark, which is when we will be covering it to the third. So you see, we will still be having the third uh, of the space for the sky and two thirds for the, um, the field. But for now, we will start with the half and half um, division of the space. Right, and um, I will try to share the reference picture every now and then. Although today's should be very easy to follow and um, hopefully fun for everyone. Right, so we'll start with the larger brush that you have. If you have a flat brush, it's great for a first background layer. You could use that as well. Uh, but since we are all using the same thing, I'm going to use the thicker brush and not the flat brush. So we are all using the same. All right, more water and your uh, clean palette. I'm going to take a little bit of blue. We're starting with the sky. We want ni a nice fresh blue. Um, mix up some color. Uh, in watercolor, you don't need a lot of paint. So I would encourage you to not take too much color, especially when you want a nice, simple uh, sky. You don't need a lot of color. Now, before we use this color, I'm going to um, go in and wet my paper in the top half. So you see this part is the sky and we are going to just use clear water with no color. Although I think I've washed my brush so it's got some color already. Um, and this is just the first wash with clear water. There's no color. So what we're going to do is a wet in wet technique. You, you, you When the wat the paper is already wet, color spreads in a different way. And especially for the sky, you get some nice, interesting uh, spread of the color, which you could actually use to your advantage to have an interesting skyscape. As you have all seen, uh, especially here in Loudoun County, we get beautiful sky colors um, in the evening, different seasons. So feel free to experiment here. You could have more pink tones in your sky. You could have, uh, you know, brighter blue, gray tones, really depends on what you're thinking or feeling at this point. It could be more blue or it could have pink and orange or yellow too. So you see, I took the bl very dilute blue color, not a lot of color in it. And on the wet layer, just put it there and you get a nice even fill. You won't see your brush strokes. You'll see a see the color spreading really nicely. Now, if you see, I did the top, but I, I, I'm I not filling in the whole space because I'm thinking maybe I should get a little bit of pink or purple just because I, I'm thinking of a nice evening sky. Um, you could also completely change the look and feel of this and think of a bright, sunny summer sky, right? So um, every time you do this, it'll ha it'll reflect your mood for the day or just kind of have its own unique feel to the sky. Right. This should be fun. Let the water do its thing. Um, but once you practice this regularly, watercolor sometimes says, don't overdo anything. Just let the water guide you. And I'm going to do this little pink purple um, tone for the sky. Now, if you don't have a pink in your um, palette, I, you could use red. I would recommend that do not use white to create a pink just yet. If you were to use any other opaque medium, white would be fine. But in watercolor, it starts to take your colors uh, to be more pastel. 
and they just create a different look and blending is not the same. And in watercolor, we blend a lot. Um, why is blending not the same? Because every color that you blend with it will start to get the, the pastel shades. And if that's not what you're looking to, um, to achieve, you wanna stay away from the whites just yet. I am going to hold off. I like the the mild, gentle feel of the sky. I'm going to use a little bit of orangey red. Uh, once again, if you have red, you could use uh, a little yellow uh, to make it orange if that's what you want in your sky. I am actually still undecided if I want um, summer flowers today or I want to just go with a multicolor theme. So feel free to explore and experiment. Now, as you see here, I'm not going too close to the uh, to to the line we drew to demarcate the space because other colors will be in that space. Now, as you're doing this, make sure you don't have puddles of water because when it dries, you will see a patch um, that will be lighter colored. And then if you try to go in and um, fix that, you, you'll start to overdo it. It happens to me all the time. So I have to remind myself, if you see um, an area where the water is collecting because of a dip in the paper, like I'm seeing some here, wipe it on your um, kitchen towel, paper towel, or um, rag that you have. With a dry brush, clean with no color, just run it over it so that the brush, brush can actually lift some of that water up. All right? So as that dries, we are going to move into create, doing the bottom layer, um, the background for the field. Now, as I go in there, I'm going to use the lightest green possible. We will be doing multiple layers to um, to, to add darker greens, but this is the first layer. This is just going to fill in all those white spaces that you don't want in a dense field. Um, use the green and you could use, uh, to create a green, you could mix yellow and blue. And for a lighter green, you want to use uh, a more yellow and a little bit of, um, of blue. As you keep adding blue to the green, it'll go, um, become a darker, deeper green. So you can see here, I really don't have a lot of color. It's um, mostly water. That's the first layer. Now I'm going to start at the bottom, not at the top. And I'm going to go closer to the middle line, but not all the way. Uh, in this case, even if I did, the blend would be just nice because blue and green together will create the shades you want. But if they were contrasting colors, you'll get a muddy brown. So you don't want those two colors to be too close and the water to, um, to, to um, blend in and give you a brown gray blend. Now, what I forgot was to make the paper wet first with clear water. So I'm going to do that now. I think it's OK. It's a little forgiving today more than otherwise because we will be putting so many layers of greens and different colors in this part of the work that none of those brush strokes are really going to show. They're just creating a nice background. So I think it's okay, but I should definitely think and plan more. In watercolor, you do have to plan more. You have to start with the lightest first layer and then build upon it. Unlike other um, mediums like acrylic and oil, you could start with the one that you want to do first and go from there. But in watercolor, you can't do a dark color on a light. Uh, you cannot do a lighter color on a dark color because it's a transparent medium. Right, so I'm going to take a little bit more green here, uh, only on the sides where I know that I'm going to have a little bit more darker areas. The way I'm planning the light is I want the light to be in the central space here. So we'll have brighter colors of the flowers in this area, and they'll blend in a little bit more with the background here. So imagine if the light was shining in this space, you'll get more clarity in the objects placed there than the ones on the outer side. 
as always is in any artwork even in photography you're always thinking of the light colors can change you could also do monochromes but the light is what decides where do you put the shadows which side is dark which side is light not a lot in our work today but that's something you want to always keep in mind so that's the first layer the background and now the fun begins i am going to cover parts of it that i don't want to get a lot of color on so this is just a piece of brown paper i have around me you could use just any paper you have around you or from a notebook this is to cover some areas and to expose certain areas that need um, color so what we're going to do next is again wet on wet with the splatter technique i'm using my medium brush this one and i'm going to take a little bit more concentrated color the consistency would be, would not be as much water but i'm still not talking about any thick color we are still talking about a nice free flowing consistency of this color and as you can see i'm going towards a slightly darker tone i want to bring it down a little we I'm will sorry. go dark i just want to make sure everybody can see and hear okay if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box or let me know you'd like to be unmuted and you could talk to Michaela directly. Thanks, Lorraine. So you see we have a nice fresh green here. We will be going much darker in the uh, next few layers, but this is our second layer and we don't want to uh, put too much dark color that we can't uh, paint on top of. So that's the green. I'm going to cover the sky space so we don't get too much of the green splatter on the sky, but I'm going to keep a little bit of it open on top above the middle line that we did. Now, this is your color, the brush loaded with this color. And use any other brush, turn it around like this, and place this on it, and you're going to do a tap, tap. You see this? And this is a wet in wet. So as the droplets of green fall on the paper, they are going to um, they're going to spread on the paper. It's sometimes called a cauliflower effect, but that's what you want. This is your first layer, and you want it to be fading into the background. This is not your top layer. Now what I'm doing is I'm doing more splatter on the sides and less in the middle. Uh, so that I can do more flowery colors there. I do want a little bit of splatter above the middle line because you saw, as you saw in the reference picture, we are going to do some stems that will go into that uh, sky space. All right. So this is a really fun activity. I could do this all day long and you could do so many fun things without doing much detailing. I am going to, for a, just a little bit, hold off on any more greens, because if I do another layer of darker green, I won't be able to have other flower colors pop on it. So I'm going to put some flower colors splatter and then come back to adding the darker green for depth. You see how we get a little bit of green above this middle line? I'm going to keep it that way for now. I'm switching over now. This palette has it's taken over by the green, so I'm going to have to find some cleaner palette. I have some orange and red already from something I was doing previously. I'm not the best at cleaning my palette regularly because I always feel that. I might actually just use that color, so I'm not going to wash it off. Every now and then you have no space and then you have to come back to a clean palette. So I have the thicker brush. Um, I, I, I have, The thicker the brush, the splatter would be bigger. You'll get much larger drops. And I think at this point I just want it to be, I uh, don't want it to be too big, so I'm going back to um, the medium-sized brush. 
hitting some of that um, red color. You could do red, yellow, orange, um, any, any colors that you've chosen for your artwork today. I'm going to do a blend of different shades. So once again, we are doing the same splatter technique. I'm going to hold on to one brush as a base. And in the whiter spots, I want some nice red splatter. This is also going to bleed and blend like the first green layer, but you also get to start marking some flowery colors um, and reserving some spot for it. Make sure you are also splattering a little above this middle line. That's, I like it already. It's just watercolor, even without a lot of details, looks just so much fun. Now what I did is, I'm going back with the same medium sized brush, the same red color. I'm just doing, going to touch on a few of these flatter spots to get another brighter layer of red. Just where the splatter spots are. So you're adding a third dimension to that splatter. A little bit of depth. I like to put it on the lower side, not that it really matters in this case, but you know, the lower parts get less light, so that's where you get darker color. How are you doing if you're painting along? Any questions? Another thing to note is the flowers that are closer to you in terms of the distance. So if you see this as a three dimensional uh, space, this is closest to you, this, uh, this layer, this plane. So the bigger flowers or the bigger blooms will be closer to you. And as it's further out, you'll see them much smaller and a lot lighter in with almost no details. So keep that in mind as you do that. I am also going to get some orange that's red and yellow mixed together. I just added yellow to it and you see I got a bright orange. I wanna add some orange to the mix here. The dots that I do behind are going to be much smaller. And as the sky dries, and it's much drier than, than the layer here, as that dries, the quality of the splatter will be different. It will not um, cauliflower the way you see it here on wet on wet. You see this here, they're more like dots. So but another thing is if, there, if you have a thinner brush, you'll get finer splatter. And if you have less color on your brush, you'll get finer splatter. So I'm, to, I'm gonna go for that. I want a little bit of fine splatter here on the sky space. So all right, I'm gonna hold off. For now, now we will go back in with the greens. Add another layer of green. This is my palette from before, the same green. I'm going to add a little blue to it to get a darker green. This is our next layer. We're ready to add a little bit more depth to our work. Now I'm not going to do splatter right away mainly because I don't want the areas where we have the flower colors to kind of get um, overlaid with too much green. So we're going to start with, and this is a good time to just blend in shades of greens. You know, you can go lighter and darker every time you load up the color on your brush. Feel free to, um, to do more shades. So I'm starting from this end here, and I'm just touching the brush on the paper and touch, move, touch, move. It's not a lot of strokes. It's just adding color to those areas. Staying away from 
the flower. As we do this, um, be careful. Don't use up all your available space because we want to add more flowers. So, um, and we also want more shades of greens. So just keep some spaces open. The darker tones will go on the outer side where the light is less. I'm going to get a little bit more yellow for a lighter green like this here. Um, to have a lighter green around the flowers in the center because this is where the light is. In a dense, densely um, forested space or two, lots of plants, the lower part of the field, you won't see a lot because it's so dense that it's dark just because the light cannot go too deep into to, towards the root end of the plants. So you'll have darker shades at the base. And as you work your way up, the colors will be lighter, more yellow. They'll be catching more light. I added more blue for a darker tone here. I'm just going fast, but I'm still doing the same. Just touch and move, touch and lift, touch and lift. There are no broad strokes. I'm switching over to the finer brush. I want to add a few lavender like twigs or things that um, maybe like the hollyhocks things that are you know nice and tall that will stick out of the the other plants so for purple we are mixing red and blue if you want a reddish purple yeah, more red less blue if you want a bluish purple you could do more blue and less red I think we will need both to create nice shades and a little depth in our um, uh, flowers. So I'm starting with a more reddish purple and then I'll add more blue to make it brighter. So now you want your paper to be a little bit more dry than it was before, especially for a tall standing stem you don't want it to blend too much because the flowers are small. So I'm gonna just do a test. I think it's okay here. And the way, way we're gonna do it is on a smaller piece of paper, we're really just doing impressions in the direction of the little uh, flower stem. All right, and then you could just get some green and make it into a stem, but that's really what we are doing. Starting here, this is when you can also think about which way is the wind blowing. If you want all these stems to sway in a certain direction, you could control that depending on how you place these tall stems or they could be just happily swaying in many different directions. Now, I don't wanna to go too detailed, but I do wanna identify some of these that are going to be sticking out. Um, if you think your color, uh, purple color is not showing through, like in mine, it's looking very dark and it hardly looks like a purple or a violet. I added a little water uh, to um, the, for the color to show through. Once again, remember we talked about light. As we get closer to the center where things are a little brighter, 
you might want to go a little towards the orange like it has the sunshine um, that, that's changing the way the color looks. Colors are pretty much always a function of light. I'm not sure if you guys have seen it before, but uh, every now and then you get you come across some of those forwarded things on what color is it? Do you see a pink dress or do you see a blue dress? And a lot of it is a function of light. So sometimes you're so sure I saw a certain color and someone has said, no, I wasn't wearing a blue dress. I was wearing a purple dress or a red dress. So depends on the light conditions around you. And if there is more sun in the middle, you will not see the purple like sun, but it will be sun washed in the light of the sun. So it could change a little bit. Just have fun with it, with the placements. As you can see here, it's a lot more wet and I'm getting a bigger bleed and that's fine. It will help me blend some of these and I got the ones that I want to be dry on the other side, uh, on the top. Any questions on the chat? Does anyone want to share how it's going? I am going to go back to my green now to give these a little bit definition, although much of this will get covered as we do more layers. Still doing the same, a little squiggly base to it. If anyone's painting along, did you have fun with the splatter? This was my finer brush. I'm going to switch over to the medium sized brush. I do see a big patch of green here, so we'll go back and start blending those in, going back to the green. So far, our steps have been we did the first layer of the sky, then we did the first layer of the meadow, uh, a lighter green. Then we did the green splatter and then the red splatter for the flowers. And um, well, now we'll be going back and forth between the colors uh, as we build the layers of green and different flowers in the space. So feel free to go back and forth. If you think you want to highlight some flowers, feel free to do that. If you want to uh, blend in the greens, you can do that and we'll be going back and forth. There's no one way or no wrong way to do this. Using more yellow in this space here. Once your paper is dry, what we are now doing is wet on dry. So we have wet color on the brush and the paper is dry. Moving back to more green away from the yellows. 
This is now wet on wet because I'm using the wetness of the yellow tone with more green. So they are blending in. I don't want it to look like two different colors, but just the light um, bringing out the different um, tones of the green. As it gets higher in this field here, we'll have more definition to the greens than what we have at the base here. And keep in mind, as you go, the dots or the brush strokes will be much finer at the top. Be sure to use lots of water. If you think it's too light, you can always add another layer. Bring in a little bit more yellow. As we're moving up, in this space here, I want to add more yellow. Imagining that the, this area is catching more sunlight. I'm going to wash my brush now, taking a break from the greens. You see, we still have blank spaces here. So there's opportunity to put some more flowers. I'm going to go with um, orange like shade for some flowers here. If you want, you can give a little bit more definition to flowers closer here which really is like three or four sto strokes for it to look like a daisy or a flower. Another, as you can see here, that's pretty much all you, could, how much detail you can put in there. And if you touch your brush with a little bit of red on the yellow and the orange, you see how the color travels by itself. I'm just putting it in the center and it's going to travel a little into the petal, which gives it a nice blend. For this painting, this is way too much detailing. But just good to know if you want to show a few flowers here that here that are closer to um, the position that you are looking at it from, then you could do a few flowers with that detail. I'm going to go with a really, really dark blue. And uh, I don't use black, but this blue will look like black. And you can do a little center to it may not be a daisy, it could be uh, what's the other flower um, that you see along the roadsides. Um, lots of wildflowers. You see, that's really what we are doing here. By the way, if you are doing just something as simple as this, don't forget that these make great um, gift tags with a little thank you on it. I, I personally love these little fine strokes. So going back to this, 
If you want to do some flowers with a little bit more definition to the shape, feel free to do that. I think I have some space here. Going back to my orange, I want to make sure I have a little bit of that throughout. When you're trying to uh, put color on color, this is where you want to increase the density or the consistency of the color. Just re reduce a little bit of the water, but again, very free flowing. So your brush shouldn't be dry but you can take a little bit more color so that it's, it stands out and it pops on the background. We could be doing all of this with splatter too. Um, the only reason why I'm not doing much splatter yet, we will do a little bit more uh, in a bit, is I wanna make sure that the green doesn't overtake the whole space and then we struggle for the flower colors to show up on it. Everybody's now, uh, saying the splatter is the favorite, their favorite part, Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's very relaxing and uh, the effect is just, just so, so pleasant. So I agree, mine too. So wherever we put the orange dots, now I'm going in there with a little red See, when it's wet, it's the best time to add a second or a third dimension to it, just to give it a little bit more um, the third dimension and it doesn't look too flat. There will be more splatter. And these blends and bleeds actually are a very interesting characteristic of uh, watercolors. So, you know, it's not like it's not done right. That's that's what people love about watercolor. It just blends in. I am going back and forth between the reds and oranges to get some dimension to it. You will also realize that you could do the same technique multiple times, but you will never create the same painting. Every time you'll have something different, something new. Now I'm going back to the green, um, adding more darker green, not a splatter, but the same technique touch and lift. So it looks like uh, there are leaves without much definition, but still impressions of a leaf. You see how dark I'm going now? This is almost like a third or fourth layer. In this corner here, I'm getting what I talked about before. There was a little bit of a water puddle and I have a patch here. Um, when we were talking about the sky, we talked about it. I think the sky dried really well, nice and even. And this one, since it's in the middle of the field, we can always add more layers and it, that patch won't show. But that's one of those things. When you have too much water, when it dries, you'll start to see the patch. I hope you're having fun. 
I'm going to continue on with adding depth more at the bottom and even more on the sides with the light being focused in the center. Keep adding blue to make your greens even darker. In the corner, if you start to feel like there's you want to make it more, more depth, the brown is a good color to add to add depth to your work. Now, if you don't have brown on your um, in, in your set, brown is basically red, blue and yellow mixed together. So whenever you get a big mush of colors, it's either grayish or brownish and brown and dark blue are great for adding depth to your work. But if you want a fresh look to your work, then you want to stay away from those colors blending in. It'll be too brown and a little dull. So this is what we are doing. Uh, continuing to add greens here. A bit lighter in this central space. I do want to come in and add some more purple flowers that don't have in this space. You can go back and pick the color from your palette. We really um, don't need too much. So by, by now you've probably mixed and blended in so many shades, you can mix and match those. Do a little bit of the bluish purple um, as you know we talked about it before and I didn't come back to doing that tone um, would probably be nice to add. You see here this is a bluish purple. Just want to add some depth to these. We will bring in the white a little bit towards the end. I hold off on using white because once I put that, I'm going to end up going more towards the pastel shades. So holding that off when everything dries, then we'll do a white splatter, um, which will just stay white and not blend in with other colors. Right, so going back to splatter, I'm going to bring the little um, piece of paper I have to cover. Once again, covering the sky, but this time I'm going to cover not too close because your paint may be still wet, but if you put a couple of brushes and then place your paper on it, it won't touch the, uh, the uh, artwork. I'm just keeping it on the lower end uh, to do the splatter again because I want a dark, really dark green splatter. I don't want the dark green on the upper side, so I'm gonna just do the lower end. All right, enjoy splattering. So same thing, I have the brush, I'm gonna tap on it, going closer here for bigger splatters. You see, this is really dark. The beauty of this platter is it blends like a real wildflower, not say, staying so defined. So just the way you see it, you see some petals, some petals hide behind other uh, flowers and petals, and that's the look you get from here. So you see how dark we went, and that's the lower end. Now I'm gonna make the green a little bit lighter, but still darker than what we have, and then extend this platter to the next uh, layer here. Still splattering, but not as dark. Right. So 
especially when you see big patches of um, color when it's drying, you want to splatter on it so it gives it a little bit more definition. Right, I'm going to slide it a little bit more, going for a lighter tone of green, a little yellow, splatter again. I do have to share um, Ellen Krimitrind, if I'm saying her name right. She does a lot of such work, and I am always inspired by some of the um, watercolor landscapes that she does. Now I'm going to move this a little bit into the sky, not all the way up. I'm going to share my reference image one more time. Of course, it's very different from what I'm doing today because of just the colors I've chosen for the flowers. But if you see here in this one, I did not cover the sky, the upper part of it. So the splatter's gone all the way up to the top, which I did not want. But at that point, I didn't um, think about it. So now when we are doing this, I want you to open up a bit of the sky, but not all the way to the top. So we are now going to see the splatter, which looks a little different because it's going to be more on the dry uh, part of the, the image. And you'll see those as more um, defined splatter. So start when your brush is fully loaded. Do it on the lower part because you get big splatter spots. Then as you go up and when the color is less, then you'll get finer ones. And I want finer splatter on the top. So you see how fine those are here on the top. And now there's almost no color, so it's really fine. So load it as you need to. In the splatter also, you can change the direction of how you're holding the brush. So if you want more splatter in one direction, you just turn it over. I think I want a little extra on this side and keeping it light in the central part. It's also a good time to do a little bit of a dark but not a thick splatter, but a fine splatter to give the top layers more dimension. So you see this. It's easy to get carried away and just keep doing it. Right, there we are. I'm going to wash my medium sized brush. Take some yellow on it. And before it dries too much, I want to do, or actually, if you're not comfortable with that, you can take the fine brush too. Take some yellow on it. I'm just going to transfer it from here. Um, and add just a little yellow along the green splatter here to give it some dimension. And it's perfect. In fact, it's nice if it touches the other colors too. You'll get a nice blend. This is when you can start to pull the stems a little outside of the field, like the ones that are tall and sticking out. Just that way. I could have done a splatter for this as well but I wanted it a little bit more intentional to make sure that the green splatter I have has a little yellow to it. And I'm uh, controlling where I want the taller stems to be. So um, you, you can't control that much in a splatter. So kind of blending techniques. Right. Since I have color on the brush, I'm going to use it anyway. The top layer with more yellows. What do you think you're having fun so far? If you are painting along or if you decide to try, give this a try later, I would love to see your work and feedback on uh, how, how the class went for you and um, how you're using these techniques.
right, so now you we're going to add some stems on the top to give um, the branches a little bit more definition and some stems here in the bottom because it, even if it's 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 a big uh, cluster we'll see some lines now you can choose to use the finer brush that you have or you could choose to use your thicker brush if it has a nice fine tip on the top i often like to use a thicker brush if it has a good tip because it actually gives you a really fine line I'll try to use both so you, you'll see how both work. All right, so in this case, we're doing something slightly different. Is I don't want to load the whole brush with color. I want it more on the tip. And not a lot of water now, but just so, see, this is a lot more color than I had before, but it still moves very freely. You don't want it to be too dry. Uh, so that you get nice free flowing lines for the stems. You see that? You're on your palette, you can see how this will flow or not. If there's enough color, you can try it out there. The artist that you said you admire? Um, Ellen, E L L E N C R I M I T R E N T. She has a YouTube channel and you'll see a lot of such things she's doing. All right, so I have my brush with the tip with plenty of color. This is where you can give a little bit again, like we talked about the wind or the direction of the stems. Um, you, you could have some squiggly little branches. Just very light touch. You don't want thick um, strokes to stick out on, uh, on the top. Usually the stems on the top are usually very fine and um, skinny. So, All right, with that color, if you have more color on your brush and doing thicker sto strokes, um, you could go into the denser part of the bush here at the bottom and do the strokes bo bottom to top bottom to top not a lot but you know as as you do the stroke up you will see that it becomes narrower and finer just like we did here you start with the bottom and go up so you'll get a nice little uh, blade of leaf or grass so you want to do that here as it's closer to you you can see some stems and that's what we are doing here in the lighter areas you want some finer stems not a lot just kind of peeping through the dense wildflower um, space here so you don't want long continuous lines. As you go closer to the top, you do want to go a little finer, go slow. It's always nice to break a blank space with just one little stroke or one stem of the plant coming through. What I did here, I'll show you on this. I took, I made a little fine line and with the same color, just go on the sides with dabs like this, like its leaves and then space it further apart towards the end as it gets less dense. So these are the stems with leaves. And if this was a little bit more detailed, not in this case, you it's not. But if you take a little bit of yellow color and then put it in here, you'll get such beautiful greens. I didn't create another color. I just took some yellow with the green that's already there and I just 
Enjoy the blends. Maybe you can come back with a clean brush with no color, just water, clear water, and blend these out. So when the, oh, it's all too wet right now. But with just clear water, as you go there, you can create more shades. So if you were to do something a little closer, you could be doing stems like these. All right. I think we are almost there. We have our uh, white, but I'm gonna hold off, not yet. The other things. If you think you want more flowers in certain areas, feel free to go ahead and add another layer of the flower colors. I'm going to do that because I think I want to make sure that the colors pop. And as it dries, it will fade a little bit. So I'm going to take just fresh, nice red. Um, just I, I go over what you already have for it to stand out a little bit. The paper is fairly dry now, so what you do now won't blend and it's going to um, really pop. Especially on the really dark green, the red dots, they look beautiful. So if you know about contrasting colors, red and green are contrasting colors. So if you have, to, if you have a lot of green and you wanna create a little bit of interest, you break it with a contrasting color. So one red flower in a field of greens, the red flower gets the focus. Similarly, purple and yellow are contrasting. Now what I did different in this one uh, compared to what I have before, I had more pinks in it. This in today's work, I have more uh, reds and yellows. Adding a little bit of the flower color to the top of the stems also, so they don't look too planned. Adding another layer to the flowers. And when we add the layers, don't cover the uh, earlier la layer 100%. You want those areas where it's faded with parts of it brighter. Um, and that's what gives it the third dimension. So we don't want to cover the entire space. Any questions or comments? Can you spell the last name of that artist again? C-R-I-M-I-T-R. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait. C-R-I-M-I-T-R. E-N-T. Okay. Alan, right? Yes. Okay. There you go, everyone. Everyone's really loving this flattering, Michaela. Uh, one person commented, commented that it's like pointillism. It is. It is. It's pointillism with watercolors. <laughs> and pointillism itself is its a very relaxing therapeutic activity. Uh, and you can do so much with point. So pointillism, for anyone who is not familiar with it, it's 
take take a pen or a pencil and you just do dots so it, it's it's a lot of dots and just with dots you can create denser or lighter areas and you use that for creating textures so yes this is just faster way of doing it you get hundreds of dots in one splatter so um yep now i'm going to wait just a little bit for it to dry a, a little bit doesn't have to be completely dry and we will get our white color ready so i'm going to uh, some of you may be familiar with it um i'll be honest i had not heard of gouache until recently maybe a couple years back so i, I never used uh, used that before but gouache is i'm going to spell it here That's gouache. So if you're looking for that, it is opaque watercolors. So it is still watercolors. It blends in well with water. Uh, you can, you know, mix and make shades. But what it does do is it gives you a more opaque layer. So in that case, if you are you don't have to plan as much as you do in the watercolors because in watercolors you're planning light to dark. It, when you use gouache, you could go dark to light because it creates an opaque layer. So even if you do light on top of dark, it, it, you, it, it will show very well. It's, it's much thicker consistency. Uh, I don't use that a lot because I like the blends. Using gouache, you won't get those blends. You have to put the color there and it'll stay there. So it's a, it's, it's a slightly different way of handling it. Having said that, I use gouache white more than I use any other colors because once I do a splatter like this, you see there is, there's so much dense area here, right? Now, if we do a white splatter, it'll just create the little balance between the dense and the lighter spaces. So I use that to do a splatter at the end. I'm not mixing it. It won't be very watery, so it won't blend in with what we have. It's just going to create some uh, white spaces. So white gouache is something nice to have at hand. I do not have that today. I'm going to use the white that I have from my watercolors. Um, so I'm just going to use a thicker consistency so that I don't get um, um, I don't it doesn't blend in much with the colors that I have. Something else that I've used in the past is, but it can only be your last layer. I had acrylic white color, which is also opaque. So I did a splatter with that. So some of those things you could do if it's the last layer. Uh, once you put acrylic, it won't blend and you, it won't even allow you to put another layer on top of it. So just as you understand your medium, you'll start to see what, how you can leverage those and when to stay away from it. Right. So I'm using the fine brush because I want fine splatter. Um, thicker white color, so I don't have it on my palette. I put a little water here itself. Of course, you want it to be the consistency that will splatter well, but as, as dense as it can be because you'll get more opaque than transparent here. Same thing, bring your other brush, hold it as um, a base to splatter on. I'm going to start splattering from the sides here and um, yeah, have fun. Um, for all of you attending the program, I want you to know that it is being recorded and it will be available on Loudoun County Public Library's YouTube page sometime next week, probably. So if you, um, if you couldn't keep along or you started late, you can watch the video and do it all over again. And if you couldn't keep up with the painting class, that's okay too. You don't have to be exactly where we are. Point is just to try the different techniques and experiment with mixing colors and that kind of thing. Absolutely. And having fun, just have fun. The more you do it, you will discover your own techniques, your own style. Um, and create your own special style. 
All right, that's right. Do, do you see that on camera? I'm, I wonder how clear it is. Um, if you wanted to do some pink, this would be a good time to add some pink flowers too. Once again, gouache would be a great medium to use because we are going to use a lighter color on top of it. Just the way we are using white, you could also do a pink splatter. I'm going to stick to white. I like the warm color scheme going on here. I took more color, bigger splatter here. Believe it or not, my phone, my hair, they all often have splatter. Um, you can tell I use it a lot. It's fun. I think that's that's everything. This would also be a good time to add a little bit more dark green areas if you want to uh, show some uh, depth. While we have a few minutes, I'm going to continue to add some depth in this, but I'm open to questions or any comments you may have um, while we finish up. It's done. Uh, you, you could stop at this too. I just want to add a little bit more depth with the darker, really, really dark green. Usually the base of a flower that's uh, visible, it's nice to put a little dark, so um, it gives it the third dimension. Um, Michaela, someone's saying she's having trouble getting a really dark green. Any mixing tips? Um, sure. So it's really the uh, amount of blue you have in your um, mix. So that's yellow. I'm adding blue. This could go really dark. If you want it to be almost like black, this is a good time to add brown, or if you don't have brown already, add a little red. So you see how dark this gets. And this is a good color to uh, use for the really, really dark um, areas. Try adding a little brown, uh, oh, sorry, a little red to your mix. Let me know if that works. I'm gonna use this. Thank you for your nice comment, Christine. That's sweet. Let me know if that works. I highly recommend, unless you're trying to get a gray tone or a, you know transparent tone, we I don't use black in my watercolors, and I only use white for things like these. This is almost as good as black. I can add a little bit more red to get even darker. And this will give you a deep color, more than black, because as soon as you add a little water to your black, you get a gray and very transparent. So it really doesn't allow you to get the effect of black. However, if you're using um, acrylics or um, gouache or oil colors, then black does what we wanted to do to have a dark, deep effect. Did that work for you, uh, using a little red to get a deeper color? Uh, 
Um, someone said she thinks her blue isn't really a true blue. It ends up a bit brown. She might just need a new blue. I see. A Prussian blue um, is a good blue for going deeper, uh, for a deeper tone. Another thing I have to remind myself is to not get carried away. Um, um, people I look up to for painting tips and techniques, they always say, walk away from your work, come back after a few hours or next morning, and then decide if you want to do more or it's enough. So you need to give it some time, observe it from different angles, and uh, then decide if you want to work more. The most fun part is to remove this tape because it almost look like, looks like your work is framed. Um, be careful when you're removing the tape. It could, so, some paper, depends on the paper and the tape, you could uh, peel off a layer of the paper. So you might want to pull it away um, so that even if it rips, it doesn't rip a part of your work. My tape didn't uh, cover too well. I do have a little splatter on the side, which I actually don't mind. You may not want to do any more splatter, but you can continue to add some deeper color even after you remove that. I just can't stop. I'm sorry. All right, that's that's everything. If you don't have any more questions, um, ready to wrap up. Anyone have any more questions before we say goodbye? Thank you all for joining us today. And just as a reminder that we've got a bunch of art classes on the Loudoun County Public Library um, YouTube page, and this one will be there too sometime next week. And we've got some live acrylic and paint pouring and water classes coming up in the branch. So check our calendar, library.loudoun.gov for upcoming art classes, both virtual and in person. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. And if you want to send everybody. your pictures to us, Michaela, let me have your email again. All right, let me write that down. It's art essence, right? It's art essence by Mekla at gmail.com. Let me see. Okay, so if you want to share what you did today with uh, Michaela, she loves to see what everybody uh, worked on and accomplished in the painting class. So feel that free to send her a picture. Thanks, Lorraine. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend and um, have fun splattering. <laughs>